Chapter 4, Energy from Combustion, Part 1. In this lecture, we're going to introduce the concepts of fossil fuels, energy, and so on. We're going to look at the efficiency of energy transformation, and we're going to talk a little bit about the chemistry of coal. What is energy? When you think of energy, perhaps an energy power plant comes to mind. You know you burn methane in your home. You've heard a lot about alternative energy. But fundamentally, what is energy? Can we see it? Can we measure it? If so, how do we measure it? How do we talk about quantifying energy? Let's check out a couple videos introducing concepts behind energy. How do we obtain energy from coal? Well, we have to burn it. And to burn it, you first need to heat it up. Once you heat it up and get it going, it releases more energy than you put in. And we use that energy to heat water. The water begins to boil and generate steam. And the power of that steam, the expanding gas, pushes a turbine, which then in turn generates our electricity. But now let's talk a little bit more about terms and vocabulary used with energy. Energy itself fundamentally is the capacity to do work. Work is movement against a force. So we're not only talking about a physical force like taking your hand on your coffee cup and pushing it forward. That is work. But we can also talk about electrical work. The amount of energy a battery has to put out to move a stream of electrons through your mobile phone. Heat is energy that flows from a hotter to a colder object. Temperature determines the direction of the heat flow, as heat always moves from a hotter object to a cooler object. And the way we want to conceptualize heat is that it's essentially a measurement of the motion of the average speed of particles or molecules in that system. So when you stick a thermometer in a cup of water, it's measuring, in a sense, the number of collisions the molecules in that cup of water are having with the thermometer. The hotter the water, the faster those molecules are moving on average, the more times they collide with the thermometer, showing an increased temperature. Let's try to visualize this and look at what happens when you cool and heat a liquid. Now you see here, even at cold temperatures, there's a certain amount of motion between the particles or atoms. The only instance where we would get absolutely no motion, not even a little wiggle or vibration, would be at a temperature called absolute zero, or zero Kelvin. Now, if we heat the system, watch what happens to the molecular movement. Hopefully, you can see a difference in the speed of the particles and the number of collisions. That's essentially what temperature is measuring. It's measuring an average of the faster speeds due to the input of energy. 
Thinker Buddy question. Which statement about the water in these two beakers is true? Beaker A has 50 milliliters of water, and it's at 80 degrees Celsius. Beaker B has 50 milliliters of water and is at 40 degrees Celsius. A, both the average molecular speed and total heat energy are the same in both containers. B, there is the same amount of heat energy present in both containers. C, the molecules in container A are moving faster on average than the molecules in container B. Or D, the average molecular speed is the same in the water in containers A and B. The correct answer is C. Beaker A is at the higher temperature, 80 degrees Celsius. And as we mentioned earlier, temperature is a measurement of average molecular speed. Let's take a look at a video describing the fundamentals of thermodynamics. This field of thermodynamics is specialized in that it studies energy, its forms, the mathematical expressions used to describe them, and so on. I mentioned the Kelvin degree scale for measuring temperature earlier. I just want to point out that it has the same degree size as Celsius. Um, and again, temperature is a measurement of molecular movement or average molecular speed. And what we set zero Kelvin to is no molecular movement, which actually theoretically may be impossible, but uh, we've actually managed to slow molecules to very, very, very close to zero degrees Kelvin. And it happens to be equal to negative 273 degrees Celsius. So let's review some of the concepts in the videos. Um, the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It could only be converted from one form to another. You can't, unfortunately, like in Harry Potter, have a flame of energy or fire or what have you come out of your hand unless, or your wand, whatever you're using that day. Um, and not have come from somewhere. That's probably why wizards get so tired, because they actually use their internal energy to produce the magic. OK, uh, potential energy is one type of energy, and it's due to position or composition. Kinetic energy is energy due to movement. One example of this is photosynthesis. The plants absorb light, and they store that light energy into building plant material. That plant material has potential energy. And frequently, we either burn it as wood or eat it and are able to move and do things. So we're either combusting it as wood or we're having our own type of internal combustion, releasing that energy and doing and allowing us to do kinetic movement. Another example of potential versus kinetic energy used very typically is this kind of potential energy of the water behind the dam. It has higher potential energy due to its position. It's high up. And when it opens the sluices, the uh, water goes downwards and starts moving pushing against turbines again and generating electricity. But when that water begins to move downwards, it's um, releasing that potential energy as kinetic. Thinker buddy question. When fossil fuels are burned in a car, blank energy is converted to blank energy. Well, you can look at the fossil fuels as having potential energy, actually storing energy in the molecules. And when we burn that energy, we can drive our car. We can move. We can go from one place to another. And that would be considered kinetic energy. 
Let's apply the first law of thermodynamics to power plant and its efficiency. So energy can be tr transformed from one form to another. And you can look at the whole process of producing power as potential energy in the chemical bonds of the fuel, whether it's natural gas or coal. That energy is burned, creating kinetic energy, which moves a gas turbine. That's mechanical energy. And that movement generates electricity. Now, when you convert the thermal energy and transform it into work to push that gas turbine, the second law of thermodynamics tells us it cannot be 100% efficient. We can't take the energy from every particle that's released in terms of the maybe hot gas from burning the fuel and channel it 100% efficiently into turning the turbine. The second law of thermodynamics is telling us that entropy or the disorder of the universe is increasing. Energy will be dispersed in any process. There is no free lunch. You can't just transfer energy magically without losing some energy in the process. No electric power plant can therefore completely convert one type of energy into another, whether you're burning gas or coal or even nuclear energy. Some energy is lost, often in the form of heat. One way to calculate this and put a number to this is to look at the energy produced and actually put out by the power plant versus the energy theoretically we could have obtained from the fuel. And if we want to put it into percent, we would multiply by 100. Another way to calculate efficiency or net efficiency is when you're given the efficiencies of the steps in production of electricity. So in this case, the efficiency of the boiler is given, the turbine, the generator, the transmission lines. And if you multiply those together when they're in their fractional form, not in their percentage form. So what I mean is 90% before you multiplied by 100 to obtain the units of percent, it was really just 0 0.9. And the turbine fractional efficiency would be 0 0.75. If you multiply all these numbers together in percent form, you're going to get a huge number, not a number that's less than 100%. So you have to multiply the fractional forms and if you do that, you come up with 0 0.58 approximately. And then if I want to convert that back into percent, then I multiply by 100. And I can say, OK, the net efficiency of all these steps is 58%. Not very efficient overall. Think her buddy question. The reason why no energy plant can be 100% efficient is because A, the first law of thermodynamics, which states energy cannot be created or destroyed. B, the second law of thermodynamics, which indicates that for every process, there must be energy lost. C, the first law of thermodynamics states heat is lost when energy is transferred. D, the second law of thermodynamics, which indicates people don't have the skill to use energy efficiently. Or E, say what now? The correct answer is B, the second law of thermodynamics, and actually the third one as well. But the second law essentially indicates for that every process, there must be energy lost. The first law just has to do with energy not appearing. It has to come from somewhere. And for D, it's not that we don't have the skill. It's a fundamental law of the universe. It's essentially impossible. Let's talk about the units we use in measuring heat. We've set a standard called the joule. And we've defined it as the amount of energy required to raise one kilogram 10 centimeters against the fourth of gravity. 
Now, we also use the calorie, as you know, on food and t when talking about food energy. And that's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. It's a very tiny amount of water. The conversion between the two is that one calorie is about four joules. And one kcal, that's using our metric prefix kilo, is a thousand calories. Now, when you see calorie on a nutritional label, that's not our scientific calorie. That's known as a nutritional calorie. And if you ever travel out of the U.S., you'll actually look on the food labels and see the appropriate kcal, which is what nutritional calories really are. What this means is when you have a 450 calorie donuts, it's really 450,000 calories. Mmm, maple bacon bars. Why do you have to be so tasty? Thinker buddy question. What is the net efficiency of the electricity produced from burning one tol ton of coal, which generates 3 times 10 to the 10th joules, if only 1.5 times 10 to the 10th joules makes it to your house? Well, for this problem, we would have to take the efficiency or the energy obtained, rather, at your home divided by the energy released from the fuel. And in order to put that in percent form, we'd have to multiply by 100. So essentially, we're looking at 50% now let's talk a little bit about the chemistry of coal here we have someone it looks like coal in the form it's actually being pulled out of say a mountain or underground it doesn't come out as pure carbon it's usually a very complex mixture and there's other elements in it, including hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. Even though very frequently when we're going to be talking about the combustion of coal, we'll just write solid carbon because the majority of the atoms in a gram of coal are carbon. Now think about it for a moment. Why does coal, when you burn it in a power plant, or how can it possibly generate sulfur dioxide? Well, let's take another look at that compound formula. There is sulfur in that compound formula. And what do you have to do when you burn coal? you have to combust it in an oxygen-rich environment. So therefore, that sulfur can form bonds to the oxygen atoms, form the sulfur dioxide gas, and go out the smokestacks of the coal plants. Let's get a historical reference point for the consumption of fuel. This is the year down here on the x-axis, energy consumption in a 10 to the 18 joules, so a huge number of joules. And you can see right around the Industrial Revolution, we're seeing the use of coal skyrocket, eventually petroleum products, oil, gas, also increasing dramatically. We see some contribution due to hydroelectric power, and then nuclear power increasing, and then leveling off to a certain degree. One thing I want to point out is that not all coal is created equal. Why do you think that is? What could affect the energy content of coal? There are two factors that may play a role. First of all, how easy is it to extract that coal? Is it surrounded by a bunch of other minerals or rocks? Or is it relatively 
pure in terms of veins of coal, perhaps, and easy to remove from the ground. And the second factor would be building upon the first factor, in a way, when you actually remove that coal from the ground, is it mostly coal, or is it combined or alongside of many other things that has to be separated? So different regions um, have different types of coal, and it's just comparing this here, uh, wood coal, uh, down here to it's one of the more pure types of coal. So this slide here shows international coal use. And as we can see, 1999 is in green, and gold is 2009. Uh, not much change in the last 10 years in most of the world, but you can see how Asia has undergone a period of extreme development where their energy use has, uh, or the amount of coal they're burning has doubled. This ends the first part of Chapter 4.